It's a story that begins in Coventry in 1896. Pulling Power Now tells the Daimler story. I've always wanted to say this. James, bring the Daimler. We're going for a spin. Perhaps the 1927 limousine, ma'am. Not yet, John. We'll be sampling upper-class Daimler motoring later. Rolls-Royce are for jam-pot millionaires. Gentlemen have Daimlers. How about the 1959 Majestic Major? George, we'll be testing one of Daimler's faster saloons shortly. Incredibly enough, up to a speed of about 40 mile an hour, it would just outperform a Jaguar E-Type. How about a 120 mile an hour Daimler SP250? Oh, please. If I was an 18 year old when this was around, I'd have given my high teeth to have one. It's not a Daimler, darling, it's just a boy's toy. I mean a Daimler that oozes conspicuous consumption. The 1950s car that cost the equivalent of seven terraced houses in Coventry. The DE36. Yes, it is, but I bet most people under 40 have either never heard of Daimler, think the company went bust centuries ago, or think it's a German car. Well, they're wrong on all counts. The Daimler brand is alive and well. It's made by Jaguar in Coventry, and it's as British as roast beef. The company started in 1896, moving into a disused cotton mill in Coventry. Frederick Sims, an engineer, bought the rights to manufacture the German-designed Daimler engines in the UK. He sold out to the newly formed Daimler Motor Company, and its first mass-produced cars were on the road in 1897. This was the forefront of engineering as, as we know it today, from motor engineering only. No electronics whatsoever. The handling of the car, I would think, would be very similar to that of an original horse-drawn vehicle. It obviously has cart springs and wooden wheels with solid tyres, so you feel every bump, every crack, every cat's eye, and even a white line can have quite dramatic effects on it. Of course, one of the biggest problems with, with a car like this, with the fact that you don't have any acceleration, is that when it comes to hills, it's quite normal for the passenger to have to jump off, either to push the car up the hill or just to simply aid by getting off and displacing his weight somewhere else. Yes, hills were a problem, but they were nothing compared with getting started. The term, let's fire it up, was probably originated from such a vehicle. We used two Bunsen burners and literally set fire to the car. These Bunsen burners move onto two ferrite rods, which act as spark plugs. So you have the combination of heat, you introduce some fuel to it, put some air to it, and theoretically, it should go every time. Not surprisingly, the public took some persuading that these contraptions were better than a horse and cart. In the early days of Daimler, when they were trying to encourage people to change the motor car, they actually took a car up to Morven, uh, the intention of climbing the Morven Hills. This, I think, certainly surprised a lot of the locals at the time. Uh, this strange vehicle without a horse actually got up to the top with the people on board. The public may have been sceptical, but the then Prince of Wales was a real enthusiast. He took delivery of a Daimler in 1900, the first in a long line of Royal Daimlers. By 1910, Daimler had built some 20,000 cars, a quarter of the output of all cars manufactured in the UK at the time. Those early Daimlers were really nothing more than horseless carriages, but they had evolved into some of the most luxurious and sumptuous cars in Britain. The 
in the mid-twenties, everybody's image of King George V and Queen Mary is always in their massive Daimler limousines, which are basically mobile drawing rooms. And they absolutely oozed luxury. Sitting and riding inside them, you literally you feel as though you're sitting in your own drawing room at home. In the 1920s, if one could afford a Daimler, one certainly didn't drive oneself. Thank you, John. And this is how one talked to one's chauffeur. Shall we motor then, John? Very good, Mum. What sort of family would have bought a car like this? Bearing in mind the cost of it, new was four to five thousand pounds in wow. 1927. Today that would have equated to probably something approaching quarter of a million pounds. So you're talking very much of the nobility and gentry and royalty that would have been able to afford a car like this, plus of course afford the chauffeur to drive it and maintain it. Now I notice in the inside that it's as if one side is really quite different from the other. Why is that? In theory, there is the off side is the ladies' side, ah. which has the scent bottles, the little notebooks. The gentleman's side has the cigars and so on. Yeah. It's all done so that when you went out to your very posh ball or dinner, the people in the back arrived in absolute pristine condition. And of course, the chauffeur was not usually expected to do what I'm doing now, which is to talk <laughs> back to you. <laughs> In the late 20s, the repercussions of the Wall Street crash forced a merger mania amongst Britain's car makers. Daimler, now part of BSA, took over Lanchester and began making smaller cars for the middle classes. In the 30s, every Daimler car, bus and truck had a remarkable pre-select gearbox. Now, it was halfway between a conventional box and an automatic. So, David, in the simplest way possible, explain to me how pre-select works. A pre-selected gearbox will determine the gear you wish to use. We're in top gear at the moment. Mm. Now, if I want to change to third gear, I move the lever yeah. and press the gear change pedal. That's my left foot. So, like a clutch? No, not a clutch. It is merely a gear change pedal. I see. I'm now putting it in top, press the gear change pedal, we're in top gear. What sort of people would have driven this car? For the middle 30s, a car costing a thousand pounds would only be owned, or possibly by your company mm. chairman or people of that same stature, who are not necessarily the sporting types, would want comfort and luxury. This epitomises it. It's unique. It's a three and a half litre 1936 Sport Saloon. It has all the features, built-in jacket system servo brakes, sliding roof, companion sets for the rear seat passengers, automatic choke. We're talking quite posh really, aren't oh, we? Oh, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. The royal family became one of Daimler's best customers. In an era when a royal visit brought thousands onto the streets, when men doffed their caps and crowds waved flags and cheered, the car that carried kings and queens was always a Daimler. And some of the royal family's historic cars are in the museum on the Queen's Sandringham estate. The first Daimler bought by the Prince of Wales in 1900. And a rare Daimler used by royal hunting parties. This vehicle being a 1936 Daimler shooting brake, it was first used by King George VI. The royal family obviously um, keen on their outdoor pursuits, the shooting and the fishing. This vehicle being unique, has a fold-down table which is actually stored up in the roof section for seating up to ten members of the royal family or their shooting party, and obviously keeping out of the, the English weather, as it were. <laughs> the bodywork is quite unique. The exterior of the vehicle, the, the steel panelling, has actually got a wood grain effect which was created by dipping a feather into the paint and getting the strokes to look like natural wood. 
the royal family actually would have liked the vehicle to look like a complete wooden vehicle, and I think they've actually got it. After the Second World War, Daimler was still the dominant state car. The royal family ordered 17 for their tour of South Africa in 1947. The cars, all painted royal blue, were driven to Buckingham Palace for inspection and then to the docks. To Daimler, the future must have seemed secure, but they were in for a shock. In part two, how Daimler went from royal favorite to the world. There's a tantalizing display at this year's motor show at Earl's Court, and one of the highlights is the return of the Austin 7, but in what a different guise. Nice and cheap too, I believe, well under 500 pounds, but don't forget purchase tax. In 1950, while the big British car makers were launching small but cheap family cars, Daimler stuck to its huge, ponderous limousines. And incredibly, in the post-war period, when food and clothes were still rationed, it launched five DE36 Grand Touring cars, known as Green Goddesses. They were stunning, and so was their seven grand price tag. It is the most beautiful car I have ever seen. And it's practical too, after all. Mercedes and Persia may be praised by motoring journalists for providing powered hoods with their latest models. Daimler? They were doing it 50 years ago. OK, so it takes a bit longer than 20 seconds, but poetry in motion. Fantastic. Undoubtedly one of the great classic cars of the 50s and worth around £100,000 today. But in those days, the Daimler brand was a mystery to most car buyers. Until one woman, Lady Nora Docker, decided it was time for a change. Her husband, Sir Bernard, was Daimler's chairman and on the board of BSA. He was her third millionaire husband. Not bad for a Birmingham girl who'd once scratched a living as a pound-a-time dance hostess. They owned a private yacht. They were the A-list celebrities of their time. Her main thoughts were to produce show-stopping, stunning vehicles which would attract people to the name of Daimler. And she was successful in that. She designed the most ostentatious car ever seen in Britain. It had 7,000 girl stars fixed to the body and door panels. Even the exhaust, petrol cap and wheel hubs were sprayed with gold leaf. The dockers could sip cocktails from an oak-panelled bar and plot their social diary on the built-in desk. The car was staggering. I think initially she did probably a lot of good for Daimlers from the PR side of this um, luxury and opulence and so on. All Castleford was out as a gold-plated Daimler drove by. This luxurious transport brought Lady Docker to a marbles match in aid of the British Empire Cancer Relief Fund. In 1955, Lady Docker surpassed her previous efforts with the outrageous ivory-white zebra car. It cost £12,000 to build. The dash was ivory with a complete hairstyling and makeup drawer slotted underneath, and the seats were trimmed with zebra skin. When Lady Docker was asked as to why the seats had to be zebra skin, she replied, because mink is too hot to sit on. Now, would it be wonderful to have the chance to deliver a line like that and get away with it? Drive on. I think after a while, it paled a bit, and I think it almost had a negative effect. People were being told to be much more uh, austere and save their pennies, and there was this lady that was um, flashing very great deals of money on gold-plated Daimlers uh, all over the place. <laughs> There's a BSA shareholders meeting at Grosvenor House. Only seven people came to their last general meeting. But for some reason, this one's packed out. The big attraction is the Docker's dispute, namely whether Sir Bernard Docker should have been sacked from the chairmanship. And when Sir Bernard's in trouble, Lady Docker's in there fighting. In the end, the Docker's antics and expenses became too much for the grey men of the BSA board. For one publicity trip with the Golden Daimler, Nora's clothes bill was £8,000. It included this dress embroidered with Daimler cars. 
it appeared to be costing almost as much to clothe her as it was to build the cars. And at a shareholders' meeting, Sir Bernard was ousted. In the mid-80s, I was extremely fortunate to meet Lady Nora. The thoughts came across that she was still unhappy and bitter about the sacking of her husband from the company and BSA, of course. The whole Docker period probably did more harm than good. And it can't just be coincidence that after the Docker episode, the royal family switched from Daimler's to Rolls-Royce. Now, the company desperately needed to restore its image. In 1959, they produced this gorgeous, majestic major, said to be Britain's fastest five-seater saloon. So how fast would this car actually go? Not to 60 is uh, well under 10 uh, seconds, about 9.2 uh, seconds. It was a good 10 mile an hour faster than uh, contemporary offerings from uh, people like Jaguars uh, or indeed uh, cars of Italian manufacture, which puts us into a sports car class. What's so special about Majestic Majors? Now, I know you can spend an hour and a half answering that, but sum it up for me. The special thing about the Majestic Major is the fact that you have a boardroom ambience, uh, plenty of leather, plenty of wooden veneer, as you can see, and yet it's a car which performs and handles as a sports car. We must remember that when the Majestic Major was introduced, its performance was a quantum leap away from the other traditional products that they were offering to the marketplace. And then Daimler designers produced something completely out of character. It was almost as if they knew their P45s were in the post and they were going to go out with a bang. Yeah, they built an out-and-out -out sports car, the Daimler SP250, a V8 2.5-litre machine with fibreglass bodywork. Now, this car was built before I was born, but my dad lusted after one but couldn't afford the £1,400 price tag. Well, even though this baby's 40 years old, still packs quite a punch, that big V8 engine. Still got lots of bottom end, but it's not a real out-and-out -out sports car. When you try and turn this big steering wheel, you need muscles bigger than what I've got, really. Well, she is an old lady, so I'm not going to go thrashing around these bends. In fact, it was said that 40 years ago that if you took corners too fast, that the doors would fly open. And that was because the fiberglass body was flexing too much on the chassis. And I don't want to be doing that. Just look at the interior. Classic 60s feel to it. No seat belts. Really lovely dashboard. Chrome dials, flick switches, beautiful. No wing mirrors either, you know, this is a proper sports car that Damon were trying to produce here. It's a real classic, a real cult. If I was an 18-year-old when this was around, I'd have given my high teeth to have one. Just a shame my dad couldn't afford one. Ha, pathetic. Boys' toys, this is the real thing. Be afraid, be very afraid. <laughs> Remember George Zdanko claiming a majestic major could thrash a sports car at least for the first three or four hundred yards? Well, we're going to put it to the test. Yes! 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 Go with me, John! <laughs> Michelle, you're driving a car with the aerodynamics of a brick! Don't be such a bad loser. Now, these cars were the last built by the old Daimler company. In 1960, it was taken over by its Coventry neighbour, Jaguar. Jaguar, of course, was thriving, and we needed extra factory space. And, of course, that was the reason to get the factory in Coventry rather than go to Merseyside or Scotland like all the other firms were doing. Under Jaguar, the Daimler models were gradually phased out, but the name carried on. The Mark II Jaguar was fitted with Daimler's V8 engine. More than 17,000 were built, making it the most popular Daimler ever. 
In the 70s, Jaguar merged with Austin, Morris, Wolseley and Riley in the British Motor Corporation. Every sinew, as it were, was being worked hard on to get the production and quality right on the Jaguars. So we became a little bit of the poor relation. In the car stew that became British Leyland, Daimler was the least important ingredient. Even the stately limousine faced the axe. The future looked very bleak. The thing to do then was to reassure the potential customers and indeed the dealer network that we were going to do something about it. We had to really make the car attractive and this had to be a, a reduced price. Manufacturing engineering resources were not available to us to the level, of course, that was being put to, on the Jaguar production bill. So, uh, in actual fact, we did quite well to keep it going. Without the uh, backing of the late Queen Mother, I think that we would have had very little influence in the royal circles. The Queen Mother took her first Daimler limousine as produced at Browns Lane in 1983. And indeed, there were seven units passed to three to the Queen Mother and another four into the Royal Muse during the period which I was in charge. Today, under Ford, the limousine has gone. There are just two Daimlers in the range, the V8 and this one with all the bells and whistles and a price tag to match. So what do you get for your £58,750? Well, you get a 4-litre supercharged V8 with a top speed of 155 miles an hour. But what you really get is the experience of sitting almost as if you're in a gentleman's club. Don't stop just yet. To my surprise, it's an absolute joy to drive. I thought it was going to be so boring, it was going to be so tedious, it was going to be rather middle-aged. I couldn't have been more wrong. The current Daimler has all the hallmarks of the company's heritage. Fast, luxurious and exclusive. And although it doesn't drive like a Jaguar, it certainly looks like one. And I can't help thinking that Ford is missing a bit of a trick here in not producing the top of the range luxury exclusive car. After all, BMW have got Rolls Royce, VW have got the Bentley, and Ford have got the Lincoln Town Car. But if you were in the market for a £150,000 car, wouldn't it be nice to have the choice of spending it on a Daimler? Power returns on Monday at 10.50 with the Royal Enfield story and also at the same time Tuesday with the Rover story. Stop.